so great to have you on the podcast here today. How are you? I'm good, Jared. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's uh, It's been a few weeks. You and I first met at FinTech Meetup in Las Vegas, which uh, I know is a crazy time. So I'm glad we're able to do this post-event. But um, would love to kick off just real quickly and then we can go into your background. But, you know, how was your yeah, FinTech totally. Meetup? FinTech Meetup was great. There's so many folks that we work with who I hadn't gotten a chance to meet in person yet. So I could finally do that. So that was very valuable. I lost $25. That was a little bit less valuable. But uh, overall, it was a win. What'd you lose it on? Roulette. Slots? Roulette. No, no, no. I could Okay, you were going big, though. Like, if you got it right, you were going to double up. Go big or go home. Okay. Yeah. It's. Uh, I had a very similar story. I did the, uh, like, video blackjack. I, I was up, though. I, I walked away with, you know, nothing crazy, but 50 bucks, and I'll take it, you know? Uh, that's, that's like quite one deal. That's I lost. Yeah. <laughs> I take uh, it. Well, uh, I'm I'm really excited to have you here. And why don't we start off, since you're new to our audience, uh, well, at least to some of our audience, more than likely, tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us mm -hmm. about Cobalt Labs. Yeah, of course. So my name is Kalyani. I'm the CEO and founder of Cobalt Labs, a company just a couple of years old out of New York City in Manhattan. Um, what the company does is we are an AI-powered platform to automate a lot of the very time and resource expensive work of manual risk and compliance operations. So we work with banks, we work with fintechs, we work with credit unions, and we just help them avoid throwing bodies at the problem and and help reduce error rates and compliance. I love it. And talk mm -hmm. me through uh, what I, uh, from all the founders that I talk with, they always say, well, this is why I started the company. And, mm -hmm. but I always say, what was the final domino that fell to get you to start the company because there's a lot that leads up yeah. to it but i care about what was the final thing that pushed you over the edge to go ahead and start this mm -hmm. yeah there's a when i started a company and started this company were actually two different dominoes so starting a company i was working in tech previously and i was an ai researcher and then an engineer and so i i always knew that i wanted to to take more ownership of what i was doing and and really flex like my creative side and my technical side and all these different pieces and so my co-founder and I, my CTO, we were friends from college. We always wanted to work on a really big project together. And so we applied to the Y Combinator incubator out of San Francisco. And we got in and the day after we got in, I put in my two weeks notice and quit my job. So that was just the moment where there was that unlock where I could finally do what I knew I really wanted to do. I quit my job without even knowing what it is that we were going to really be building. So, because I just knew that we would, we would, you know, we had exposure to a lot of problems in fintech and security, and I knew I knew there was something there, and I just needed a reason to dive into the deep end. So that was kind of how it started. And we were building, you know, we were initially building a couple of different products, but what we really saw was, you know, over the last two years, if you look at even just like consent orders coming out of like just just the OCC, you know, they, it sometimes feels like there is a new action like every week or maybe even two or three times a week. And the banks that we were initially partnering with and kind of ideating with were really trying to think hard about how can we like protect ourselves from this, you know, Right now, our only option is really to hire like 15 more people to just double down on all of our existing policies and procedures. And are there ways that we can grow efficiently and manage our risk? And it was such a like acute problem and it was happening to everyone at the same time, especially to sponsor banks and banking as a service, but everyone. So we got our start thinking, OK, these people are are pouring an enormous amount of resources into solving this problem. That is extremely ripe for AI to address because it's so much of it involves manually pouring through hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pages of regulation, procedures, documentation. And, you know, what if you had an AI sidekick that could do all of that, you know, manual work for you so you could focus on 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 the real like brunt of your work? So, yeah, that that's kind of the high level of how we got started. And how was Y Combinator? What was your experience like? Uh, y Combinator was great. I think. There, there's always so much advice that people give that doesn't actually hit home until you realize you're making the same mistakes that everyone before you had made and they had already told you they had made them. And so I was confronted with a lot of a lot of really simple things that that a lot of people don't understand about starting a company and really thinking about like making something people want. So I, I think I just learned a lot of I was able to imbibe a lot of their wisdom within a very short amount of time, which was which was amazing. As cool, to, as cool as it is to go out to San Francisco and, and build there, do you think it'd be cool to have like basically Y Combinator New York? 
I think there's there's something to say about like the density of like new entrepreneurship coming out of coming out of YC. Like I think it was it was really valuable to be at like this one epicenter where everything is happening. And then now time has gone on. A lot of our clients are based in New York or based throughout the country. And so there's no longer this like really burning need to be in the Bay Area as far as our company is concerned. But I, I just think like so many amazing startups have come out of SF. And so it was amazing to like get our start out of there for sure. Makes total sense. Yeah. Talk me through life for, for these companies before Cobalt Labs and after Cobalt Labs. Mm -hmm. You mean the clients that we work with? Yes, clients that you're working with today. Yeah, totally. I'll give an example for a fintech and for like a financial institution since sometimes things can look a little bit different. I think with the fintech, a really concrete example we saw was that we had a fintech that was really investing in like manual efforts with respect to third party risk management, reviewing policies and procedures of vendors and partners, infosec materials. And and it, it really was actually just slowing down the time it took for them to like close like really important revenue generating partnerships. It was on the basis of like sometimes a month, a month and a half to even bring on a new piece of technology and like start running with it. And obviously compliance is like essential and crucial, but it they, they wanted to transform it into something that was more of like a business enabler. So they brought Cobalt in and they were able to find that, you know, reviewing like a hundred page document that normally took a couple people like multiple days and maybe even a week to really do a thorough review of they got that down to initially like 15, 20 minutes and could then run with it and have a super targeted analysis that actually made their compliance program even stronger. So, you know, they had a plan to hire 10 more people. They were able to really, uh, you know, shrink that down, stay more capital efficient, and then, and then also just, you know, close these partnerships more quickly, which I think that speed is like really crucial to fintechs, like without giving up on uh, like the robustness of the regulation. And then maybe from a financial institution side, one of our banks is is a sponsor bank and uh, is, was really in the position of trying to responsibly and like, really cautiously like expand the size of their of their fintech program. So one of the things that they brought Cobalt in for was, okay, we have two or three fintechs right now. At the end of the year, we'd like to like double or triple our volume of partnerships. Um, and so again, can we can we do this in a way that doesn't just layer on more and more manual work? And, and put us at risk of potentially being on the other side of enforcement action. So with Cobalt, they were able to keep, again, the same size of the team, but actually like double the size of their fintech program and actually maintain the same like level of rigor and, and keep it very auditable and transparent. So I think across the board, it's exciting to see how like bringing in AI, not just like adds efficiencies and saves time, but it actually just makes everyone's lives like easier because you have this person saying, okay, instead of doing this mountain of work all day, can I have my like AI co-pilot be my compliance analyst for the day and do the heavy lifting so that I can then do my strategic work? Like I think it almost changes people's jobs a little bit from highly manual work to the like strategic work that's actually most important. Have you noticed yeah. an increase in speed when it comes to like adoption lately? I, I've through conversations, like it seemed like anything AI related a year or two ago, people would be a lot slower to adopt, right? And there, there was some yeah. hesitance. But through conversations I have now, it seems like obviously they want to make sure that everything's secure. But I don't know if you're seeing the same thing, but it seems like a lot of companies, even in heavily regulated spaces like this, are more open than ever before to adopt new technologies like what you're building. Are you having the same experience? Has that changed over the last like year? Talk me through that. Yeah, it's definitely changed. I wouldn't say adoption is very, you know, is, is fast amongst banks. I don't know. I don't know who would say that. But what I would say is there's a really big difference. I think when it comes to bringing on AI tools, it's really about banks and fintechs, like understanding whether or not they can trust a solution. Like all of this comes down to trust. So before we were working with any banks, it was a really, really difficult process to get that first bank on board and really, you know, they had no one else to point to who had had a good experience with COBOL because no one else existed before them. So getting that first client to really give COBOL a chance and dip their toe into AI was very difficult, but a very monumental experience for us. And now life is a lot easier because we can say if you're unsure about, uh, you know, if you're unsure about whether or not your regulators will we'll be okay with you using Cobalt. Here, you can talk to a regulator that's using Cobalt already to review bank materials. If you're unsure of 
whether a bank found a good ROI with Cobalt here or talk to another bank. So I think being able to start building that network of trust has been amazing for us, but more so on the like, industry level side, it's becoming more normalized. I think there's more and more players in the space and there's more and more like success examples of AI actually being like practically useful in the real world as opposed to just having very flashy demos. And so I would say it continues to get better, but uh, there's there's still a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I shouldn't have said fast. I think faster. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. Definitely fast. Um, but with a caveat being you better be able to show that others are already trusting you or it'll remain as slow as it was in the past. Totally, totally. Now, would love to hear more of your thoughts. I know you kind of gave us a little bit of a what was happening at, at FinTech Meetup when we first started, uh, started this conversation. Would love to hear, though, any key insights you were hearing. Like, what are people, uh, how are people feeling about banking, FinTech? Like, what were some of these conversations you had? Um, what was kind of the optimism? Was there some pessimism? How, how are people thinking through where the space is heading? Mm -hmm. I think they're across the board, no matter who I talk to, no matter what sessions I attended, there's definitely a little bit of chaos, I think, in the world, especially of like, banking, fintech, and regulation that it, I think it's like good and bad for some people. I think we, we work with a lot of crypto companies as well on compliance, and they, of course, are over the moon right now and see like 2025 is the year that they can really start to, uh, you know, expand their market share and 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 kind of get sign off to, to release new products. And so if you segment it by industry like crypto, we, we've seen a lot more activity there and and the conversation around crypto is like, how can we take advantage of this time and do more? And there's there's other sides of it where there's a little bit of confusion saying, okay, it looks like things are obviously changing at the CFPB. You know, we obviously are not just going to stop adhering to CFPB regs, but how does this affect the level of investment we put into like certain aspects of compliance versus others and 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 how we still continue to show that we're monitoring things now in case it comes up later. So I think a lot of those conversations, I think, were 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 the crux of what I heard. But I think overall, in general, there's there's optimism that there's a path forward to to not let like politics and compliance like hold back like a business's you know a business's use case and and really what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's yeah. uh. I had a few good conversations there. My favorite conversations, though, are when I'm running into people like you and I'm learning about oh, well. like new companies. And there's just a different level of excitement hearing it from a founder, too, as you know, right? Because it's it's what you live and breathe. You're always excited about mm -hmm. it. Th that being said, like as you've been building this company, one of my favorite questions to ask people, and they're like, usually founders are like, oh, God, just one thing is what's something that you can laugh about now, but when it first happened in building this, it made you want to cry? Oh my God, that's a great answer. Let me think about it for a second. Something that I can laugh about now is probably, hmm, give me, give me a second to think. It would definitely be something around how we were initially, you know, convincing people that they should trust Cobalt. Because I think in the beginning, we came in with a little bit of I would almost call it hubris where I was like, okay, you know, I was building AI for fintech. Like I was doing all these things, like just let us, you know, completely rip out your existing compliance program and like drop this new thing in and like see what happens. And we were hit with a, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not, you know, the kind of tone that's going to go over well and you need to tread a lot more lightly. So I think if I look back at some of the emails that I sent like two years ago, I'm like, I would literally never say that in a million years anymore and i like really understand how to speak the language so i think there's a big like language in this industry that took a little bit of time for me to really sink my teeth into since i came from the engineering side but yes i definitely laugh at how maybe how much of like a and i'm still very much like a techno optimist but i think i laugh at like how strong it came on with folks that were like what is ai in the first place like slow down for a second yeah it's uh by the way, that's one of my favorite questions to ask like anyone. It doesn't even matter if it's on a podcast because you get to see the gears turning in their head of trying to mm -hmm. think back through like so many experiences and only mm -hmm. pick one. Talk me through a little bit like in terms of what's next for Cobalt Labs. Like what are what are you most excited about moving forward that you can share with us here today? Yeah, of course. What's next for Cobalt? I think especially the last year and a half 
was focused on setting up a lot of really strong like development partners and getting the platform to a really strong you know initial base and we're finally at the point where we're approaching like enterprise readiness and we're really trying to focus on like distribution this year i think we kept things a little bit more in stealth over the last year and a half and now we're kind of ready to come out and say like this is who we are you know this is what we're doing and really see like how many people we can bring on we're hiring a lot right now and so yeah we're, we're really just making this a year of growth which is which is exciting i love it when you think of what else to build how do you like to receive feedback like this is something um i love to ask founders as well it's like how do you take all this feedback and decide what gets added to a roadmap like what's your process mm -hmm. yeah so we i i have like a standing one-on-one -on -one meeting every two weeks with like every single uh, bank or fintech that uses Cobalt. Like our our entire direction is, we of course have a longer vision, but our direction about like what the product needs to be is like entirely shaped by what they want. So every time I meet with them, I'm like, be very frank. Like, what are all of your complaints? What what didn't you like this week? You know, what worked really well? What would make your life a million times easier if we added this one thing? So we have a huge log of like every request anyone has ever made. And the way we prioritize it is, number one, we can see what's common across the board. So there was one instance where, for example, when Cobalt is reviewing uh, you know, a, a policy or procedure against a regulation or against another internal standard, we, we say, okay, here are the ways that, uh, here are the gaps and here's what you need to do to fix it. When we release that, everyone across the board instantly said, okay, well, tell us what we should say instead. Give us an alternative language. Give us an enforcement precedent and give me something that I can use to actually solve the problem once COBOL helps me like surface the problem. And so it was very much like resounding from all sides. And so it was very easy. Like this is what everyone wants. This is what we're going to build next. And then everybody was very happy. So we, we, we look at like how often does that request come up and how, how much of a pain point is it for these people? Sometimes you get requests saying, hey, I have something really urgent. If Cobalt could do this one thing, this would change everything for me. And when we see that level of like, not despair or desperation, but really that feeling of desperation is what makes me feel like, okay, this is something that somebody really wants and it's an expensive problem for them and they're coming to us to help them solve it. Like that to me carries a lot of weight. But sometimes we see people saying, okay, you know, it would be nice if you can do X, Y, and Z where we kind of, it's still on our roadmap, but that gets prioritized a little bit less. When I, when I hear you say this, and I know the persistence of startups and having those conversations, this is why startups can beat, in many cases, these super oh. large companies. Because who's having that 100%. call every few weeks, with, yeah. like, actively wanting to listen? I think some of the bigger companies at a certain point, right, they tune out it and they think that they will always know more. Uh, than, mm -hmm. than their customers and then they miss out and then we just keep repeating that as like these large companies just keep com repeating mm -hmm. this cycle right um i actually have a theory that because in many cases not for every role it's getting more difficult now to hire than ever before we have obviously like mm -hmm. ai that's helping us become these superhumans and will also automate a lot of the work but I think you'll you'll we'll actually end up seeing more acquisitions over the years across every industry because you can't replicate that founder, like that founding team that is like going to mm -hmm. spend all their time and, and, and effort in creating these great businesses and actually mm -hmm. want to learn. You could never yeah. replicate that inside a big company. So you're going to have yeah. to buy more companies to, to bring in that innovation. Yeah, totally. Buy more companies or even partner with more. But yeah. I think your point like really stands. Like what, we get a lot of questions saying, okay, why should we go with Cobalt when there might be maybe a little bit less tech forward, but more established alternative that's like already deeper into the market. And we say like, look, you can call me at 8 p.m. and say like, it would be amazing if we had this thing by next week. And like, I will personally just make it happen. And like that person's never gonna do that for you. So it's it also keeps me excited because that, that to me is what's fun about like starting a startup too. I love it. Yeah. Well, I wanna thank you once again for, for joining me here today. Please keep us up, uh, up to date with any new news or anything like that. We'd yeah, love to course. continue to um, continue this conversation. But yeah, thanks so yeah, much. Sounds good. Thank you, it was great to meet you.